All right. Let's get uh, into endocrine emergencies with a emphasis on obviously the ones that we'll see frequently hypoglycemia hyperglycemia things like that but we also need to take a few minutes and talk about some of the low frequency high criticality uh, disease processes as well so what do you think that would entail in endocrine emergencies what are some things that you may not see but could be deadly you may not see a lot but could be very deadly what all right dka but that one I, you're probably not going to see that one as frequently as something like hypoglycemia or something like that where i'm going with it is some of the other endocrine emergencies that don't have to do with the pancreas and blood sugar how about Hyper, is that what you said? Yeah, hyperthyroidism, thyrotoxicosis, thyroid storm. You may also see the opposite of that, which is um, hypothyroidism issues, and the emergency in that would be myxedema, myxedema coma, that kind of stuff. And so I'm not going to spend a ton of time with all of those disease processes, but you should at the very least understand what your typical signs and symptoms would be and what the emergency care would be. Now, of course, with your hyper and hypoglycemia, there are some things that we can do um, to take care of that as well. But um, we're going to just briefly look at the components of the uh, endocrine system um, as well. Um, so just as we talked about neuro the other day, neuro is going to be your, your electrical messaging system. Uh, Endocrine is going to be your chemical messaging system. The thing about it is, is that all the systems work together and so of course there are chemicals within the endocrine system that will work on the nervous uh, components that will send uh, signals. And then there's also um, um, nervous signals that, that will um, stimulate endocrine. Now, I know I gave you all that outline. I'm not really like wanting you all to turn it in or anything. I just kind of gave it for you all to keep up with, so it's not really for a grade or anything like that, just to kind of follow along with me. Um, but patients with an endocrine disorder often have a broad range of signs and symptoms, and uh, thorough immediate uh, assessment and treatment may prevent life-threatening emergencies. Um, any alter mental status patient we want to check blood sugar right um, any patient that is having tachycardia um, hypertension jitteriness diaphoretic we want to get a good history we want to find out if they've got endocrine issues because um, endocrine issues can cause some of the same signs and symptoms as a stimulated sympathetic nervous system right um, the endocrine system is responsible for the control and regulation of all the systems in the body. All the systems in the body. And um, the hormones are your chemical messengers. And again, there's so many different types of hormones and, and, and hormone stimulating hormones and hormone blocking hormones. And, and it's all depending on the level and, and the... the um, amount that's circulating in the blood and even the gland and the function of the gland and how well it is secreting or blocking uh, the secretion and, and all that and so um, of course we're going to mention some of the primary hormones now but um, we, we probably won't like get real in depth with them. Um, with the hormones um, they're secreted into the uh, bloodstream by endocrine glands they circulate throughout the body and target organs to maintain homeostasis. Um, so just really quickly, you've got your hypothalamus. Your hypothalamus is actually part of what? We, I mentioned it Tuesday. It's part of the brain, right? But it has uh, control centers um, for um, different things in the body and it is your primary link between the endocrine and nervous system so everything that is stimulated by the nervous system that that affects the endocrine system goes through the hyp uh, hypothalamus the pituitary gland is um, also very um, very hand in hand with the hypothalamus 
um, and they're related through the vascular system. The pituitary gland is going to be known as the master gland because the hypothalamus is not a gland. It is a neurostructure that has some control and linkage over the endocrine glands. Okay? But your pituitary gland is your master gland, okay? And it's known, um, or it secretes um, um, endocrine uh, hormones or uh, hormones that control the activity of other endocrine glands. So that's why it's called uh, the master gland. These are known as tropic hormones, all right? Um, and then there's other hormones that are released, like ADH, which is also known as what? Antidiuretic anti hormone. And its name tells you what it does, right? Antidiuretic, what's it going to tell the body? Hmm? Yeah, stop peeing. Don't pee. We're going to reabsorb this fluid. So you may see ADH released in times of, of hypovolemia. Um, times of stress, times of, of hyperthermia. Um, and then uh, oxytocin, which is what? That's the... Uh, oops. Um, hmm? what? What? Yeah, so oxytocin is a hormone that, that is uh, released uh, during pregnancy and then even after pregnancy, it... it um, will stop uterine contractions, it helps to stop postpartum bleeding, things like that. Um, but it is the one of the main hormones of pregnancy, pitocin, oxytocin. Um, and then of course, um, there's a couple of other hormones that are released as well. Um, uh, adrenocorticotropic hormone, also a growth hormone, human growth hormone. So um, if there's um, issues with the pituitary gland and there is some of these hormones that are either underproduced or overproduced, there can be some massive effects on the body. Um, so in this little uh, thing here, you see some of your um, pituitary hormones. Your growth hormone, um, it regulates metabolic processes related to growth and adaption to physical and emotional stressors. So obviously, if somebody has an excessive amount of growth hormone, they are going to have usually some kind of issue with the term megaly at the end of it, right? Megaly, enlargement, big, you know? Um, thyroid stimulating hormone. Well, TSH is actually released by the pituitary gland to tell the thyroid gland to release thyroid hormone. T3, T4. Um, you've got this ACTH, adrenal, uh, adrenal corticotropic hormone. This stimulates adrenal gland to secrete cortisol, which is going to be, be a big player in some of your adrenal issues. Um, and adrenal proteins that contribute to the maintenance of the adrenal gland. Then you've got luteinizing hormone. Um, which is going to affect the reproductive system. Follicle stimulating hormone um, is going to affect uh, both men and women in the uh, reproductive system. Prolactin, you can think of prolactin as milk production. Um, I don't know, maybe lactose, lactose is in milk, I don't know. Um, and then um, antidiuretic hormone, we talked about that, and oxytocin. So your thyroid gland, it secretes thyroxine, um, and um, it also um, is a major, um, major player with your metabolic hormones and is a major player when it comes to metabolism. Um, thyroid hormones affect metabolism and are secreted in response to stimulation of the thyroid gland by the pituitary, anterior pituitary gland. Um, Thyroxine um, cannot be produced without proper iodine intake, and it is produced. Uh, production is regulated by the negative feedback mechanism. N negative feedback mechanism. What is that? Because we'll talk about it, especially with um, glucose and uh, or uh, insulin and glucagon here in a few minutes. So I think I can explain it, but not in the context of this. So it works like a Mm -hmm. So if you set the thermostat to a certain temperature, 
when the room reaches that temperature, it sends a negative feedback to the thermostat to shut off. That's right. Yep. Yep, I mean, that's exactly right. Uh, so, so in this situation here, uh, whenever we have enough of the thyroxine hormone, there's a feedback mechanism that is sent to say stop producing it. All right, so it's a, a retroactive function more than a proactive function, right? Um, hey, EMS, the basis of EMS is negative feedback. Something negative happens, we send a signal, you receive a response, right? And that's kind of the way that works. Um, you know, negative feedback really isn't telling somebody that they're fat and they need to lose weight, though. I mean, I don't know. Or ugly, because I may be fat, but you're ugly, and I can diet. Also, calcitonin. Well, we know that calcium, it does have a big uh, player in, like, uh, the, the, the polarity of our cells, especially in our cardiac cells, but also we know that calcium plays a huge role in bone. Um... Bone building. Your parathyroid glands, your, um, they secrete PTH, a parathyroid um, hormone. Works in the regulation of calcium. Stimulates bone dissolving cells to break down bone and release calcium into the bloodstream and decreases the amount of calcium released into the urine. And then your thymus gland uh, helps immune system. All right, now, how about the big, the, the big one that we're going to talk about today, your pancreas. Your pancreas, we talked about it with digestive the other day, and digestive uh, in the function of, of the digestive system. The pancreas is a digestive gland. Um, it does have exocrine uh, um, functions, but it also has endocrine functions. The exocrine functions secrete digestive enzymes into the duodenum via the pancreatic duct. Whereas the endocrine component is going to be the islets of Langerhans. Islets of Langerhans. I always thought that that was some, uh, some little vacation destination off of the Emerald Isle or something. I don't know. The Emerald Isle? The, not the Hemorrhoid Isle. <laughs> I guess that would be funny though. Uh, the islets of Langerhans. That just sounds like somewhere I want to be laid up. But if it's close to the Hemorrhoid Isle, I don't want to be there. Um, the endocrine component comprises the islets of Langerhans where you have the cell groups within the pancreas that act like an organ within an organ. Because everything that happens endocrine-wise happens in the islets of, of Langerhans, whereas with the pancreas, uh, the other aspects of the pancreas, you have the, uh, the uh, exocrine function. So you've got three cells, three cells within the islets of Langerhans. Uh, there's two that we really are concerned with to understand the... the uh, hypo and hyperglycemia stuff. You've got your alpha cells and your beta cells. Your alpha cells secrete what? Alpha cells secrete, starts with a G and rhymes with leucagon. Glucagon, insulin. Um, and then your beta cells, they secrete insulin. Okay? There is an A and an L in glucagon, so that might help you remember alpha glucagon, beta and insulin. You're on your own. I can't really find a link there. All right. Okay. So when you actually see a picture of the islets of Langerhans, it actually does not, in fact, look like a vacation destination. Um, it looks like somewhere I would not want to visit. So again, your alpha cells release <coughs> glucagon. Good job, good job, good job. And your beta cells release insulin. So the role of the pancreas when the blood glucose level decreases, your BGL, the circulating glucose level in your blood, is down. What is it going to do? Um, this is in a normal person. Yep, normal person. It's going to... <coughs> stimulate the alpha cells to release glucagon, which will convert the uh, glycogenesis. Not glycogenesis. Oh. It's, been it's lysis. It's going to break down the glycogen from the liver. All right. 
So, you're right, though. The alpha cells will release glucagon. Glucagon goes nuts on the liver door, and it says, Hey, liver, I know you got some of the goods in there. Let me get some of that glycogen. That good glycogen, you got any more of that glycogen? Yes, we do. But when you get it, you realize, hey, glycogen is in a more complex form, and it cannot be used by the cell, right? And so it has to be broken down into a more simpler form, and then it's secreted into the bloodstream, and then the available insulin then will pull that. Now, the way that our body works is it maintains homeostasis. So this happens all day long. So it doesn't wait until our body just, our, our bloodstream gets so low on glucose that we can't function or anything like that. It does this to maintain a steady supply, okay? I just wish that it would go get some of that glucose out of my hips. <laughs> all right, when the blood glucose level rises, what, what happens then? Yeah, so insulin is stimulated to be released, and then, um, then what happens? <laughs> That's right. The insulin helps bring the glucose across into the cell. Insulin is the only hormone that decreases the blood glucose levels. Okay? And then your adrenal glands. I mentioned this when we were going over kidneys the other day, but your adrenal glands are sitting right on top of both of your kidneys. They release a couple of pretty important hormones here. Cortisol, aldosterone, and then epi and norepi. Epi and norepi. That's going to be your catecholamine. So that's where one of your direct links between your nervous system and your endocrine system occurs, right? Because our sympathetic nervous system depends on norepinephrine as its primary chemical mediator. One of the big roles aldosterone plays is in what? Y'all remember I mentioned it the other day. All right, it does. It, it affects the sodium reabsorption, which in turn is going to help us with our blood pressure. All right, and aldosterone is part of the renin, aldosterone, angiotensin system, which will convert or uh, control blood pressure. Okay? Okay. You gonads. Everybody's got gonads. It's just kind of harder to kick women in their gonads, but when men get kicked, it ain't no good. I once heard, I once heard that getting kicked in your nuts, and that's probably not the medical terminology here, I hope I can go back and fix this video. Um, getting, for a man, getting kicked in the junk, I guess that's even more appropriate, um, is, uh, a lot more painful and a lot worse than having a baby. It's true. It is true. How would you know? Because. And how would I know? Because I don't have false expectations. Hey, but I'm going to tell you right now. There is a possibility you may accept the fact that you want to have another baby. There's no man that's ever been kicked in the nuts before that said, Hey, I want to do that again in about a year. <laughs> Just saying. No. It is. A chemical release during pregnancy, specifically during the actual birth. That, no, I'm not, I'm you, not, you better watch what you're saying because mine was just a joke. <laughs> no, 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 this is helping her. That literally, that you want to No, I think what he's going to say is in her justification. <laughs> but nobody else shut up. That the, there's a chemical re that the brain releases to where, not literally, but they don't remember the same type of pain that the birth was so it's not like us getting kicked we know what that feels like every time we don't well, I, tell you what well, I understand that but <laughs> it's to the point where you go have a kid again if you wanted one yes for the after effect yes for the thing that comes okay. from that yes 
I don't know. I don't know. I do believe that because I mean I don't remember. All I know is that when my baby was born, I was like, "Oh, that is such a pretty baby, honey." When it looked like a little alien. Okay. All right. Testes and the men. Not one testa, but two testes. Regulate changes of puberty. Most important is testosterone. Then, of course, you've got your ovaries in the women's. And we'll talk more about this whenever we get into the mysterious lady parts in um, the uh, future classes. All right. Endocrine emergencies tend to affect many organ systems. And even if it is something as simple as hypoglycemia, it could lead to some really bad issues, neurologic function issues, lasting effects. Um, you know, if it is a, a <coughs> overactive uh, hormone issue, uh, thyroid, hyperthyroidism or something like that um, can cause MI issue, MI stuff, uh, sympathetic nervous system. Don't don't take these emergencies lightly. And in most situations, if a patient is experiencing some type of endocrine emergency, they're not going to let you take it lightly either because it is, you know, pretty dramatic in a lot of situations, okay? So um, one important thing here, check the home for medications. Obviously, we say this for every single one, but your home meds will tell you a lot. Um, identify and manage life threats. Uh, figure out if they're alert. If there's any, any change in mental status, get a blood glucose after your ABCs are completed. All right, and really and truly, we should say that your blood glucose is, is part of the, the primary, the ABCs, when it comes to a neurologic assessment and all that. All right. Um, a lot of times, hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia, especially extreme cases of hyperglycemia, um, DKA or HHNK or whatever, you know, they may have some of the same symptoms on either side, okay? Um, of course, myxedema coma, where they're hypothyroidism, they may have some unresponsive issues and things like that too. Um, and so we'll get to some more of that. There's also some distinct findings within um, some of the uh, endocrine issues. Buffalo hump or moon phase. This is going to be because of excessive cortisol production or either excessive overuse of um, your glucocorticoid uh, steroids. Also known as what? A person that has these distinctive things is going to be known as what syndrome disease? Cushing's. Cushing's has the moon phase and the buffalo hump. Uh, mottled skin, you may see mottled skin and diaphoresis in patients that are hypoglycemic um, or pancreatitis. Um, enlarged body parts, remember I mentioned that just a minute ago, somebody that, that has a pituitary issue where they've got excessive amounts of, um, of uh, um, growth hormone or something like that. Um, you may have Edema with syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, meaning that there's a lot of the antidiuretic hormone that's being released, so we're not getting rid of the water, and so it is, what, building up within the body. Um, with hypo and hyperthyroidism, both of them have some very distinct opposite findings. Hypothyroidism may be overweight. Hyperthyroidism may be underweight because of the metabolic system. Um, exothalamus. Remember exothalamus? Y'all remember that? That's where you kind of the patient has kind of bulging eyes. Okay. Um, Graves' disease is where that's seen. Um, and so there's there's several things. Okay. Um, ABC. It's just going to be the same across the board. Transport decision, we talked about that earlier. You make the call there. If it's something that's hypoglycemic related and you can clear that patient, you know that they have somebody there with them that can give them a sandwich and not just a little, little bit of sugar or something like that, um, then, you know, you could keep them, you know, let them, let them stay there. But if not, they should be evaluated. I forgot that I gave you all that outline, so if I'm going too fast for you to keep up, let me know. Okay. Um, 
Find out about the, the, the three P's. The three P's of diabetes. Three P's of diabetes. Polyphagia, polyuria, and polydipsia. What is polyphagia? Yeah, so it's excessive hunger. What is polyuria? <laughs> yep, excessive peeing. What is polydipsia? Thirst. Excessive thirst. Why are you polyphagic? You've got lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of sugar in your bloodstream, but it is not getting into your cells. So therefore, the cells believe that you are starving, right? And so if the cells are not getting what they need, then they're going to be hungry. Let's just say that that, that door was shut and it was locked from this side and we couldn't get out. But outside of that door, there was a table full of pizza and full of, of whatever, famous Amos cookies and, and Dr. Peppers and whatever else you wanted to eat. You can see it. It's there. You may can even smell it. But until you can actually get that door open and get that food into you, you're going to stay hungry, right? Same thing with the cell when you're hyperglycemic. Yes, your body does have a lot of sugar in it, but there is a gap between that glucose in the blood and intracellularly, which makes your body think that you are hungry. You can fill your body full of food, but if that cell doesn't get that glucose, it's still going to think it's hungry. We mentioned the polyuria uh, because of the excessive amount of glucose that is being diuresed or pulling fluid off in the kidneys, right? And so therefore, if we are continually losing fluid, we're continually wanting to replace that fluid. So that's why we're excessively thirsty. Hyperthyroidism and thyrotoxicosis may cause cardiac dysrhythmias. Why? Because it is just essentially an attack on the body with excessive stimulation. Um, almost like you, you just you filled your body with epinephrine and adrenaline and it's just affecting you like crazy. Um, so the little cartoon here, I see y'all all straining to see it. It says, what do we have? You were right. Her prednisone ran out. Her physician is Dr. Larrabee. Isn't she at Hastings Hospital? Prescription bottles can help pinpoint the patient's underlying medical problems and identify his or her physician. The cartoons aren't very funny, are they? Look for your atypical findings in your physical exam. Look for your condition of skin, you know, different, different things that are, um, you know, kind of indicative of certain um, aspects of the endocrine system or endocrine emergencies. Um, obviously, you got to figure out what's the source of the unresponsive or comatose uh, um, issue. Um, obviously, your, 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 your glucose is going to be your, your first thing. And that's a lot of times you're like, please, let this just be a hypoglycemic issue. One of the uh, scenarios that, that, that y'all have done was a CVA. Um, I don't know if y'all remember doing this one or not. I, I think you did do it. It was the hemorrhagic stroke. Uh, the guy was um, laying on the floor. Sister found him after coming in from work and all that. That was actually a call that I ran on um, a couple of years ago. And the guy was laying in the floor, and he was he had kind of like the snoring respirations, often found in somebody that's hypoglycemic, and he was unresponsive. So I was like, okay, I really, really hope this is just a hypoglycemic issue, and then we can kind of turn this around. Well, it wasn't. His blood sugar was 200 and something, you know? But then his blood pressure, we, we continued to do our assessment, his blood pressure was 280 systolic, you know? And at that point, we're like, oh, no. And then we find out he has a history of hypertension that's poorly maintained, doesn't take his medicine. And then, you know, um, that's all she wrote. But, you know, you certainly want to be looking for that kind of stuff, okay? Also, other respiratory patterns, DKA uh, may exhibit Kussmaul, you know. Um, obtain blood specimens early in patients with diabetes. Why do you think they might want to early blood sugar? 
Yeah, you want to get a baseline, and you may they may want to know. And a lot of times, if your blood glucose monitor does not read, it's usually going to be around what? Above what? Yeah, around 500 or so, you know, which is in the average, maybe a little bit on the low end of DKA or something like that. The only way they're going to be able to get a serum glucose level, a blood glucose level, is if they do a lab profile, right? Now, of course, they'll draw that in the hospital, but it would be good to have a baseline there. Um, if they've got altered mental status, obviously, um, initiate treatment for less than 60 in hypoglycemia. Give your 12 and a half to 25 grams of D50. Um, and then, of course, if you suspect narcotic overdose, consider naloxone. If you've done your assessment right, and their overdose, then the only reason why you would give that stroke is if they're less than 60. But if not, then go ahead and give naloxone. And we just kind of wave naloxone around like, oh, it's just going to be the end all, save all and everything, you know. But it's really not. I mean, it does help in those rare instances, but, you know, we kind of just, it's kind of like ketamine. We love it all. Um, I was wondering, Drake told us the other day about the call where the guy the cardiac arrest said would not convert until they had given B50 because his blood sugar was low. Would the same happen with the cardiac arrest from an opiate overdose? Would they not convert until you give the Narcan or would... I mean... Is it even possible? They may convert, but they're going to go right back into it if they got into the point to where they're respiratory distress and their oxygen levels have gotten so low that they went into cardiac arrest because that's, you know, that's one of your reasons why they went into cardiac arrest or hypoxic, you know. And so, I mean, it's going to be really more of a, are you giving them supplemental oxygen and all that. I can't guarantee it's going to convert either way, but um, obviously you want to, to reverse the effects, but if you are maintaining the airway and getting reversing the hypoxia, it should convert. Um, for your comatose patients, I, I, I don't know why they recommend uh, transporting the patient with a cervical collar in place if they're intubated. I'm going to say just intubate them and secure the, the tube unless you didn't have a way of proving they didn't have a traumatic issue. There's indications of increased intracranial pressure, transport with the head elevated to a 30 to 45 degree angle, midline. Um, one of the things that we don't want to do is give glucose when we suspect traumatic brain injury or increases in intracranial pressure. All right. So getting into our disorders, endocrine disorders, they're caused by hypersecretion of a gland or insufficient secretion of a gland. So in reality, it's the gland, but it's more or less the, the hormone that's affecting the body system. With your glucose metabolic derangements, it's going to be obviously the pancreas and more particularly issues at the islets of Langerhans. All right. Most endocrine emergencies, you know, they result in deteriorating mental status. Now we're saying endocrine emergencies. Now, there are people that walk around all the time with diabetes. There's people that walk around all the time with hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism that is medically controlled. We're talking about in the acute situation, the acute setting. Um, fluid balance is affected big time. Uh, the determining issues here, degree of dysfunction of the gland, age and sex of the patient, um, maybe even the overall health of the patient. Now, as far as diabetes goes, you've got several different types of metabolic uh, disorders that we would put in the diabetic spectrum or the diabetic issues. You've got DM or diabetes mellitus, mellitus uh, type 1 and type 2. You've got gestational diabetes, which is going to usually, uh, well, will be in, in the event of, of pregnancy. And a lot of times that's self-regulating at the end of pregnancy. And then, of course, your emergencies here, hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia, 
And then you've got some hyperglycemic emergencies for diabetic ketoacidosis, which is going to be related with type 1 diabetes. And then you've got your hyperosmolar hyperglycemic syndrome, or also known as hyperosmolar non-ketotic. Diabetes. Y'all know who that is? Y'all know him? Well, I thought it was funny. I'm not going to. I'm not going to. If you don't know who he is, it is not Tim Conway. Wilford Brimley. He's the one that says diabetes. I, I can't do this. Okay. All right. So your diabetes DM, your diabetes <laughs> mellitus, diabetes mellitus, metabolic disorder in which your body's ability to met metabolize simple carb carbohydrates are impaired. Paired. Paired. Um, and of course, you've got two different types. You've got Type 1, which also used to be known as juvenile onset, and it usually is onset of ju um, when they're younger. Um, or you've got type 2. Um, but you've got polyphagia, polydipsia, and polyuria. Those are your three Ps of diabetes. Not three Ps, one big P. You may have more than three Ps when you're polyuric. Body needs two big things, glucose and oxygen. Today we're talking about the glucose, which is your primary fuel for cellular metabolism. If the body can't metabolize the glucose, it's just going to hang out in the uh, blood sugar or the blood, and then it's going to go to the kidneys, and eventually all that bombardment of glucose on the kidneys is going to cause filtration issues. All right. Um, also, all that glucose is not good for the cells, it's not, or for the uh, vessels, it's not good for healing, all of that, all right? But um, in diabetes, the pancreas either does not produce insulin or does not produce enough insulin, or the cells don't respond to the insulin, which is more of, of a rare case there. In either case, there's an elevated blood glucose, and the cells starve for glucose. In a study in 2014, which is five years ago, 29.1 million people in the United States, or approximately 9.3% of the population, have diabetes. That's, that's a large amount of people. 8.1 million remain undiagnosed. And then in 2013, diabetes was the seventh leading cause of death in the United States. So let's just be real with this. Diabetes is not just a just a sugar imbalance and, and oh I need insulin and all that. Diabetes is a system disrupting deadly disease if it's not managed. It can be managed. It can be managed and, and patients can live or people with diabetes can live, you know, successful, productive, managed lives. Alright? But diabetes is not a disease that, that needs to be ignored because it will kill somebody very quickly, not just because of the, the starvation of the glucose or the cells, but because of the systemic effects it has on the whole body. All right, so this is just a picture right here of the insulin um, allowing the glucose to enter and nourish the cells. And then you've got the, um, the, the cell right here that it doesn't have your insulin and so what happens? Well, you've got smaller amounts of glucose in the sugar right there, larger amounts of glucose in the blood right there. I said sugar, but I meant blood. And so it can't go. So, I mean, that's pretty simple. That's a pretty simple thing there. All right? The pancreas does not produce insulin. can't get the sugar in. Okay? Um, complications in diabetes. We mentioned this the other day. Kidney failure. The glomeruli becomes sclerotic. They can't handle the filtration of all the uh, glucose. You see necrosis of the papillary tissue. You run into renal failure, nephrop uh, nephropathy, or um, failure of the, the, the kidneys. Heart disease, lip uh, lipolysis. You're talking about lipids. High lipids uh, raises the fat level in the blood. They run a higher risk of, of, of emboli, uh, plaque formation. 
Uh, microangiopathy restricts blood flow. This is going to be we start getting smaller clots in the microvasculature. And then, of course, as we, we did in the um, um, case study, increased risk for silent MI because of the inability to feel pain or at least a decreased pain receptors and all that. All right. Microangiopathy, uh, microangiopathy and neuropathy contribute to an increased risk of silent MI, combine and result in patient not perceiving common signs of chest pain, pressure, or tightness, and the AMI should always be assumed until proved otherwise. So in, in reality, in that uh, patient that we had the case study on a little while ago, her becoming hypoglycemic probably saved her life. Because if she wouldn't have had that hypoglycemic episode, then you, as the amazing, awesome, good assessing paramedics you are, would have never found the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say. Eyes. Diabetes is a primary cause of blindness. The vessel is damaged, um, or the vessel is damaged by, um, I meant, I'm sorry, I missed the uh, cerebrovascular disease, stroke, and hypertension, peripheral artery disease. Uh, vessel is damaged by microangiopathy, uh, ca uh, characterized cerebrovascular disease, and are associated with increased incidence of stroke. Hypertension is present in two out of three persons with diabetes, so two-thirds of all people that have diabetes have hypertension as well. And then, of course, I mentioned this. High blood glucose levels damage the vessels of the eye, which leads to blindness. Scar tissue may pull the retina from the eye, which causes retinal detachment. And then, of course, cataracts form when uh, fructose and sorbitol are deposited in the lens. Y'all still with me here? Y'all still with me? Seen this, heard about this? And then neuropathy, loss of sensation and function within the nerves. They may experience paresthesia, um, just blunt pain perception, um, even to the point to where somebody with diabetes should not cut their own toenails. When my grandmother was alive, she had diabetes. She had to go to the podiatrist to have him cut her toenails and all that and do a good foot assessment and all that. My grandfather actually had a sore on his foot. He was a diabetic. He had a sore on his foot and it never did heal and he actually got septic from that and he passed away. Um, foot ulcers, foot sores, things like that, they never feel it. It gets worse and worse. We mentioned because the glucose is so high in their, in, in their blood that we're just kind of feeding that bacteria, feeding that bacteria, and it's not promoting healthy healing and all that. And so that's why it's very, very, very important for a diabetic patient to take care of his or her feet. Okay. All right, type 1 diabetes. So in a nutshell, type 1 diabetes uh, used to be called juvenile onset, generally affects children, but unless, you know, there is a, a cure for type 1 diabetes or they get a new pancreas or something like that, they're going to have type 1 diabetes for the rest of their life, right? But it used to be diagnosed early on, and it still is in a lot of situations, but essentially in this situation, there might be a little bit of insulin uh, produced, but in most cases, the pancreatic cells do not produce any insulin, and so these patients are going to have to be on insulin, i.e. IDDM insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus. The body develops antibodies that incorrectly identify the body's own tissue or substances as foreign invaders to be uh, destroyed. The beta cells become incapable of secreting insulin and regulating intracellular glucose. And so then they have to have daily injections of insulin or insulin through a pump. Uh, you have what's called latent autoimmune diabetes in adults. It's a variant of type 1 diabetes that occurs in adults older than 30 years, so this is going to be a later onset, later diagnosed diabetes. And then um, increased act activity and alcohol consumption can lead to low blood glucose levels. 
And with those patients, we also give thiamine as well. <laughs> Diabetes. Y'all know what to look for in a patient with uh, diabetes. Um, because most of the time, you're not going to know that person has diabetes unless they have hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia. I've had or students, they're not patients, they're students. I've had lots of students um, that have insulin pumps that, you know, I knew that they were diabetic. They would have to go out and get a snack every now and then when they started feeling, uh, you know, not real great and all that. But other than that, you wouldn't know because they were well educated and they knew how to manage their diabetes. Um, but if you do get a history of somebody that's altered mental status with uh, diabetes, while you're getting that information, of course, checking the blood glucose, I can't hound this enough, should be one of the first things you do with altered mental status. Cross the board. Um, that's, an, that's an example of just a foot sore that's not an acute, it's not something that just started. This is one of, like, an example of a sore that, that will not heal. It, 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 no matter what, they have to go to one treatment centers and all that, and it just will not heal. Question, how are they still able to walk? They're when probably they not, or either it hurts really, really bad. Well, it may not hurt, though. They don't have really good pain. It's going to be packed and all that, but... Yeah. And that's what happened with my grandfather. That's what happened with my grandfather. He had something like that. And he was a very hard worker, always on his feet and all that. You know, always wore boots. So hyperglycemia along with sweat and all that just is a harvest or a, a bounty for that bacteria. And he was in a situation where, and I'm not saying it would have saved his life. I don't know either way. I hate to think that, that any other, but they said, hey, your foot's to the point now to where we need to amputate it. And he refused to let him cut his foot off. Because his feet, him moving, him doing, defined who he was. And he felt like that would take that away from him. You know? Um, and we tried. My aunt tried, tried, tried to talk him into it. And then it just got to the point to where that wound got so bad he got septic, you know? And that's all through. Um, but yeah, that kind of stuff is, is not. It is, is kind of what you might would see, all right? Um, some patients use an insulin pump. Um, my recommendation there is to let them manage it if they're able to. If not, let family manage it if they are able to. Um, remember that just because you've had about a 30-minute talk on diabetes and, and insulin, and I mentioned the word insulin pump, does not make you an expert at it, and you probably should not. Now, at the very least, if you can figure out how to turn it off, just turn it off. All right? But other than that, let them turn it off. Let them do what they need to do with it. Um, with uh, insulin, there's several types of diabetes medications um, known as insulin available. Um, <laughs> um, You've got rapid acting, regular or short acting, intermediate acting, and long acting. And I mentioned this a little bit last semester in pharmacology, but I'll talk about it again here in a few minutes. But um, um, a lot of times the insulin pump, there, there, there's two types of, of insulin a patient needs, okay? Um, especially when they manage it themselves. You've got your basal insulin and your bolus insulin. So if you think basal, basal metabolic rate, your constant metabolic rate, all right? Mine's pretty slow, i.e. the big belly and all that. But um, um, uh, your basal metabolic rate. So somebody or diabetic patients, they have their long-acting or their basal insulin that they take every single day at the same time, no matter what. Sick, not sick, whatever. You take this amount. You take this every morning, and that's what helps them continue throughout the day. Then they've got bolus insulin or short-acting insulin, and a lot of times the this is what's one of the one of the functions of the insulin pump. Or they can also do it; uh, they can draw it up themselves. This is called also called meal coverage insulin. You ever heard of this? Anybody know what I'm talking about? 
So a lot of times patients will be on what's called a sliding scale. All right, and so when I said that, a lot of y'all look like you know what I was talking about then. So when when before they eat, now that food essentially needs to be like right there in front of them, ready to eat. Okay, but they'll check their blood sugar, and let's say that their blood sugar is 150. All right, so a sliding scale is going to say, okay, your blood sugar is 150 to 175, then you will bolus yourself two units of regular insulin. If it's 175 to 200, you will bolus yourself three units of regular insulin. And so that's kind of the way that works. And sometimes, let's say that, let's say that that person works in EMS, and they have their food right there in front of them, check their blood sugar, they bolus, and the tones went off. And they grab their food, they grab a little bit of food just to fill themselves, but this fall ended up lasting two hours. Well, what's going to happen? Well, they just bolus themselves more insulin to help cover the carbs that they're about to eat, and they didn't get that in. So what's going to happen? It's going to shoot their blood sugar down, drop their blood sugar down. Okay? So a lot of times with the hypoglycemic incidence, and that's just an example I came up with off the top of my head, but a lot of times with the hypoglycemic, it, it, it's because there was some kind of discrepancy with their blood, with their insulin somewhere along the way. Okay? Y'all ever seen an insulin pump? Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, there's one right there. It's, it's about the size of a small cell phone or a pager or something like that. And it can, a lot of times it's just on the side or in a pocket or something and it's hidden. Okay. Hmm. That beast. It's a lot more funny if you knew who Wilfred Brimley was. What was the, what was the, show, what was the show? He was just, he, he did the Liberty Diabetes Testing Supplies commercials. And he would say, if you have diabetes, get yeah. your, get your supplies. He, he, he was in a show. Though. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was. was it Dallas? I'm more affectionately known as the diabetes guy. And then this cat looks just like him too. <laughs> All right. Um, type 2 diabetes. Most common form of diabetes. Um, blood, blood glucose levels are elevated. They can be elevated for quite some time. And that patient not know. All they know is that they feel like crap. I will, I've been working in the ICU, or when I was working in the ICU, we would get patients all the time that were on insulin pumps. We managed insulin pumps up there that when they were discharged from the hospital, they were nearly diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. They would come in with a blood sugar of 1,000, 1,100, 1,200, and they would be feeling like crap, but a lot of times they were still responsive. Um, in type 2 diabetes, though, the pancreas produces insulin, but the body can't effectively use it, or either it just doesn't produce enough to meet the metabolic demands of the body. Um, again, you'll have your peas, <laughs> your frequent urination, uh, thirst, blurred vision, frequent infections, all the things that you would expect from somebody that's diabetic, but they may not have just been diagnosed with it. Remember, we mentioned a big number, about 8 million folks that have it, but haven't been diagnosed with it. Who knows what that number is now? Um, but as far as management goes, uh, <laughs> my favorite is when somebody says, yeah, I'm eating my McDonald's, but I'm managing my diabetes with my diet and my exercise. Excuse me? <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> um, but we live in a time now where we've got medications to keep doing what we want to do, and our medications will keep us alive. Yeah, yeah. And so on the resistance still puts you on that format. There well, you my, go. My mother's a perfect example of that. Well, I mean, all over the bed, she was in the bathroom saying, like, she's diagnosed type 2 on a daily. She could feel type 2 diabetes like that. She could feel off her ass. Yeah. Um, I, I live I live with this because of me or Spora. So mm -hmm. she's like, I don't have time to do this. Mm -hmm. But she'll she'll like cook it up in the morning and she'll like burn food and be prepared away. And she'll be sat in her recliner with a plate
Nice. At that point, they're not little Debbie cakes. They're big Deborah cakes. <laughs> oh, I thought that was funny. That really was pretty good. Yeah, I hope nobody... Uses. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean... I know people that are just like that too, but for video purposes, I'm not going to mention them. Um, <laughs> um, as far as uh, your medications, there's several different types. Um, and if you notice here, I'm not going to get into the actual specifics of these medications and all that. Other than I want you to understand that, that the function here, you've got a wider a range or a wider array of type 2 medications. And so a lot of times when a person is newly diagnosed, it takes a little while for the doctor to be able to get the right dosing for those medications because they all work a little differently. Now, um, a lot of times um, there are um, injectable medications. that There's not just oral medications. There are injectable medications too. I think it is... Um, uh, I think metformin, because it works at the liver, I think a patient has to be off of that for a couple of days before they can get, like, um, dye or contrast, like CT. It's one of these drugs that doesn't play well with CT, and I think it's metformin. But obviously getting a good history is going to be important there, okay? Um, Pre-diabetes. So essentially, this is going to be um, uh, blood glucose levels or hemoglobin A1C levels that are um, above normal levels. Um, a hemoglobin A1C is really a composite uh, percentage of what your average blood sugar was over the past three months. Now, it is figured in a weird number, um, so it's not going to be like your... You, they, can, they can tell you what your average... Um, blood sugar was, but it's usually um, like in numbers where a normal range of A1C level is between 4% and 5.6%, and somebody that has an A1C level between 5 and 7, or 5.7 and 6.4% means that you have a higher chance of getting diabetes. So a person with a, a you know, a 5.7 or 6.4% uh, A1C would probably be in this uh, A1 or this pre-diabetes level. Affects one out of three U.S. adults and 90% are unaware of the status. Um, Y'all seen the uh, Pikachu meme where it's like the... Oh, I'm surprised where his mouth is open and all that. Most of these folks would act like that if you told them that they had diabetes. What? I haven't drank an ounce of water since I was a kid, but I love some Coca-Colas and sweet teas and, and Oreos at night time and <laughs> chicken fingers and french fries and tacos and what? I probably am close. I know it. And not going to as long as I have anything to do with it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. Now, of course, there is a, a genetic, genetic component um, here, but um, there's also um, women that's had a history of gestational diabetes has a higher incidence of developing diabetes. Being overweight, that's the biggest one. That's the biggest one right there, being, being overweight. But I'm not overweight. I'm under tall. If I was like seven feet, I'd probably be like pretty right? Um, age greater than 45 years. I'm not quite there yet. Chris, you're pretty close. Um, what? <laughs> I said age greater than 45 years. You're closer than me, sir. So. I'm 34. <laughs> Interventions affecting two specific factors can help prevent or delay onset of type 2 diabetes. What do you think they are? Diet and exercise. All right. Exercise, diet, losing weight. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Hopefully. Not me. Not me. That's why, but it just all stayed over here. That line of Oreos that I do every night has nothing to do with that. Is that fat three Oreos? I'm not one of them. Hmm, that about made my head explode, Jody. Alright, let's get through gestational diabetes and then we'll take a break. Alright, um, gestational diabetes, uh, glucose intolerance during pregnancy. Um, women usually or have to take a glucose tolerance test early on in pregnancy and um, if they fail that test then they have to go back for more testing. The issue is, is that um, it will directly affect the child that is developing in their uterus. Um, Women with gestational diabetes or even predisposed di or people that, that had diabetes, um, that leads to higher birth weights, which obviously is more dangerous for a woman. Um, and uh, they do check the A1C and all that stuff. Um, but during the pregnancy, if they do have gestational diabetes, they're going to have to manage it like regular diabetes. Um, and then, um, you know, usually after the, the child is born and they don't have that demand on their metabolic system, they usually will resolve back to normal within a few weeks of delivery or so. Um, so, all right. Let's take a short break. Alright, so hypoglycemia. Low blood glucose level, uh, they mentioned 45 milligrams per deciliter or less. We know that normal is 60 to 100. The body likes his numbers, but somebody that does have a history of diabetes, uh, they may have a little bit higher baseline blood glucose level. So I have seen patients that have what would be considered a uh, low end of normal for us and they actually are experiencing hypoglycemic signs and symptoms because their body has grown accustomed to higher levels um, and so again we're going to treat um, the, the sym symptomatic treatment here you know um, but essentially you know you know your treatment for hypoglycemia you're all advanced DMTs at this point and so you know it uh, uh, And I mentioned this earlier, uh, hypoglycemia usually is going to be a result of type 1 diabetes. Uh, too much insulin, too little food, or both. Uh, we got too much insulin, um, and we, we ate our normal amount, but hey, something happened and we bolus too much insulin or something like that. And so it used up all the carbs that we had. Or too little food. Um, we have our normal amount of insulin, but something happened today and we didn't eat like we were supposed to, or both of them. So counter-regulation is body's natural defense to maintain blood glucose at appropriate levels, also known as the negative feedback mechanism. So what is our treatment um, as far as what we need to do? Um, that's going to be to replace the uh, carbohydrates or the, the glucose uh, that has been used. Um, reduce uh, um, The body's first line of defense is reduce insulin production by the pancreas, increase glucagon production by the alpha cells. However, if we have some... If, if we're in a situation where we have, um, where we're uh, diabetic and we have to bolus ourselves insulin, then, you know, there's really not a way that we can reduce the insulin other than just give more deck or more glucose in order for it to be moved over. Um, then, of course, there's catecholamine release uh, and then uh, autonomic nervous system uh, generates the counter-regulatory uh, hormones as well. Um, look for that patient that is altered mental status. They're, they're acting drunk or they're acting intoxicated. Check their glucose. Treat the glucose first. See what happens from there. Now, uh, prolonged hypoglycemia can lead to brain issue, can lead to insulin shock, uh, diabetic coma. We want to make sure that we're trying to prevent that and we, we attack this as quick as we can. Um, my grandmother used to, she was a diabetic and she used to have sugar spells, what she called sugar spells. and. Um, I called it more like the demons in her and her because she would just act not her normal self. 
your management, if they're alert, we want to do oral glucose um, and then followed by something that is high protein. If they uh, uh, cannot um, do that, then we want to get an IV line of D50. Um, for children, we want to do a D25% solution. For adults, a 50% solution. Um, and then a uh, third line of defense would be uh, glucagon uh, IM, one milligram. And the thing about glucagon, though, is that it actually has to perform what glucagon would do normally if it was released, and that's go to the liver, pull out the glycogen, break it down into glucose. So it's going to take a few minutes in order for the glucagon to work. So that's naturally why we want dextrose uh, as the preferred uh, med. Now what you've got to be careful with with the D50 is you've got to make sure you've got a good big vein because it is pretty viscous so it is a little bit harder to push. You can push it to a 20. You just need to be uh, um, you know a little slower with it. Might even help to have a little bit of fluid hooked up with it to help push it. Um, but if you notice any sign of uh, extra, uh, extravasation or if you notice that the vein is blowing at all, you see any redness, anything like that, immediately stop giving it because that dextrose is necrotic to the tissue around the vessel. Um, when you recheck the blood glucose, it, it may shoot up, but that's okay. But they do need something to eat. All right. All right, hyperglycemia. So just as regular hyperglycemia, um, where we don't have any um, other uh, patho with it, uh, blood sugar is just a little bit high, they probably will probably be experiencing excessive thirst and urination, but it's probably not going to be an emergency. Uh, what we're looking at is when we get into um, diabetic ketoacidosis or um, um, hyperosmolar um, non-ketotic. Um, there are a couple of other uh, phenomenons that, that can cause hyperglycemia. The dawn phenomenon um, actually occurs in the hours before waking. As the body prepares for a new day, it releases hormones such as cortisol and catecholamines. Both are released by the which gland? What gland releases cortisol and catecholamines? It sits on top of the liver. I mean, not the liver, the kidneys, uh, the kidneys, uh, yeah, the adrenal glands. Uh, these hormones trigger a release of glucose from the liver, resulting in hyperglycemia. So early morning is the body's kind of getting ready for the day, so it's trying to give the body a little extra fuel as it's getting ready to get up. That's called the dawn effect. Then you've got the Samoji effect. It is a phenomenon that occurs when a low blood glucose level generates a release of hormones that initiate a release of glucose from the liver causing hyperglycemia. Nonetheless, it's on the negative feedback and it is a endocrine. Um, hormones are causing more hormones to be released, which causes the blood sugar to go up. Um, so with DKA, DKA is going to um, be a hyperglycemic uh, disorder, but typically the sugar levels, the blood sugar levels, are going to be a little bit lower than HHS or um, hyperosmolar non-ketotic. However, um, the, the, the differences here are, are um, physiological. Um, we know that diabetic ketoacidosis results in the breakdown of fatty acids which result in the release of ketones, which if the patient reads the textbook, they're going to have acetone breath, uh, you know, all the typical uh, Kussmaul's respirations and all that stuff because they're acidotic. Why? Because when the the cell is um, when the, the the cell is trying to feed itself, essentially, when the cell is trying to metabolize and create energy, it requires glucose. Well, a person with type 1 diabetes does not have any insulin at all. And so what's happening? The cell is starting to self-eat or cannibalize itself, right? Mm -hmm. What is it doing? It's starting to consume the, the fatty acids that are within itself, which produces the ketones, all right? which produces the byproducts, which are the ketones. Okay? And so therefore, that's why it's ketoacidosis. Now, they're still going to probably be dehydrated because there's lots of glucose and it's being dumped out and all that. But um, 
The uh, deficiency of insulin prevents the cells from taking out the extra glucose, the ketones in the bloodstream. Um, the ketones are released from the uh, cells into the bloodstream and it increases the pH and this results in acidosis. On top of that, the patient is dehydrated. So that is going to um, increase the serum content of the glucose because it doesn't have as much plasma to float around in. Um, the metabolism of fat uh, generates uh, the, the ketones. Because glucose must be excreted in the urine in solution, the body loses excessive amounts of water and electrolytes, sodium and potassium, which lead to disturbances in water balance, furthering uh, the acid base uh, acidosis. Um, now, with um, as far as signs and symptoms, they're going to be pretty similar, and I'm going to mention the uh, hyperosmolar in just a minute. But with just hyperglycemia, you know, and diabetic ketoacidosis, one of the things you'll also see with DKA, according to the uh, textbook, is you cushion loss respirations. The deep, rapid. Um, this isn't hyperventilation. It's more of a where they're actually taking full breath, but they're trying to release a lot of that uh, acid. Okay, your three P's: polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia. Um, LOC deterioration, uh, Kussmaul's respirations, warm, dry skin, dry mucous membranes, the fruity odor of ketones on the breath. Is it true that that never happens? That their breath will always stink because of the bacteria and the ketones and all? No, I mean, I don't believe that that would be a consistent uh, textbook sign or symptom if it never actually no, happened. You won't be able to smell the you might be able to. Some people are able to smell it. Some people can't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I usually try to stay away from a patient's breath and depend on my other signs and symptoms. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, you know, your, your ultimate thing here is going to be that you check a BGL, and that's going to tell you whether it's, you know, what it is. But if it is hyperglycemia, um, on page 1276, you can see a table of the different um, um, signs and symptoms between the two. Um, and uh, there is some differences between the, your DKA and then your non-ketotic uh, hyperosmolar. Um, but um, the big thing is is that you want to uh, um, know whether their blood sugar is low or high. If their blood sugar is high, our treatment is pretty much the same across the board. Uh, we're going to give lots of fluids because they are dehydrated. Um, and if it's low, then uh, we're going to give glucose. Now, as far as with their blood glucose levels being super high, um, well, I always get the question, well, why don't we just give insulin to bring it down? Because their blood glucose levels need to be brought down in a controlled setting where we can continually watch. They need to be on an insulin pump where they are having their glucose levels brought down very slowly, usually over a course of around 24 hours. And even once they get it down to a certain level, around 250, there's actually protocol to actually hang a, um, a, a dextrose-containing solution. Why? because we don't want to bottom their blood sugar out. We want to continue to give them some dextrose there because we are still giving insulin and we're still trying to manage that across the board. So the bottom line is, is that in the field, we would do more damage bringing a blood sugar of 700 down to 120 in, in a bolus of giving insulin than if they get on that, that, that drip and they stay hydrated, they, they keep their metabolic rates up, we, you know, when somebody came in on an insulin pump, we would check their glucose every hour. We would adjust it based off of their needs. And, and so um, bottom line is, is that there's really not enough control for us to give insulin in the field. Also, um, look for sharp, uh, sharply peaked T waves. 
um, because this may be uh, signs of hyperkalemia, which often occurs when you have uh, acidosis. Okay. And with so be the same dose of one milli equivalent per kilogram on the sodium bicarbonate. Mm hmm. Yep. Um, and then uh, a sine wave is where, remember, we, we call it sinusoidal in um, um, cardiology. And it's just where the, the potassium level is getting so high that you cannot differentiate between a QRS complex and a T wave. Uh, then their blood glucose levels start going down, and that's not good. So there are some big time... Um, electrolyte imbalances when it comes to DKA. All right, what about hyperosmolar hyperglycemic uh, syndrome? It also is called hyperosmolar non-ketotic coma or honk. Honk. Honky. The term hyperosmolarity describes concentrated blood resulting from relative dehydration. Essentially, what that means is that um, we have a lot of a solute and not a lot of a fluid, all right? And so when that solute makes it to the kidneys, what's it going to do? It's going to pull the fluid with it, right? Because in order for the glucose to be released through the urine, it has to have a vehicle to ride out, right? And so it, it, because it is a higher osmolarity, because it is a higher, bigger solute, remember, water is going to move to the area of higher concentration, a solute concentration, to try to equal out. That's just the way the water moves, right? And so it's going to continue to pull fluid off until we can get the levels of glucose down. Does that make sense? So in this, though, you don't have ketones. You don't have the production of ketones. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. Because there's insulin being produced in type 2 diabetes, right? There's, there's maybe not enough to get all the glucose in, but there is still insulin being produced, so they're still getting some glucose in to make the cell feel like it is getting something, all right? To where it at least is not going to be cannibalizing itself, okay? Um, go back to the example I used earlier. Let's say that we're all cells in the body. Oh crap, I lost the key. We don't have windows. There is hot and ready pizzas and a taco truck and I don't know, whatever else you want that's delicious. I love tacos and pizza. Everything you could want to eat is right out there in the hallway, i.e. the blood vessel. Right? But we can't get the door open, right? We can't get the food in. Well, for my illustration here, which gets a little bit dark here in just a moment, uh, we can't. So we're stuck in here. Days. That is dark. <laughs> hours, days, weeks go by. We're looking at like the Lord of the Flies situation here. We're, 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 we're about to start cannibalizing somebody because we got to survive. So we're going to start eating somebody. All right? But, let's just say that the door just gets open just a little bit, a little bit of pizza comes in, and it's enough just so that we can just get a little taste of something so that we get a little bit back to our senses to where we're not going to start eating ourselves. Really terrible dark analogy, but that's what it is, alright? <laughs> DKA, we end up cannibalizing each other, and of course, the aftermath of that byproduct of that is really not good. Uh, H&K, um, we get just enough food in here to just kind of keep us there, but we're not getting enough to, to, to consume what's being brought to the hallway out there. And eventually it all has to start going down the hallway and then out the door. Alright, cool. Alright, cool. Cool. So what's our treatment for both of them across the board? Um, the, the clinical features are going to overlap and the symptoms are going to essentially overlap between HHS and DKA. They're going to be hypovolemic. They're going to be dehydrated. 
they get we give them lots of fluid in rapid transport. All right. Now, in ketoacidosis, you notice that their pH is low, right? You see, it's less than seven point three, normal seven three five, seven four five. With their pH here, their at their their acid level is is okay, right? Because in general, the glucose isn't going to affect the acid level if it's hanging out in the blood. It's just the fact that we have ketone bodies that are present here, which contribute to the acid doses. Okay, so HHS or HONK, whatever you want to call it, is a hyperglycemia of type two. DKA is a hyperglycemia of type one. All right. Bolus of fluids. Uh, keep an eye on their blood pressure. All right. Any questions about your hypoglycemic or hyperglycemic issues? No? Okay. Pancreatitis. Um, inflammation of the pancreas. It, acute form is a medical emergency. Uh, there's also chronic uh, pancreatitis. Uh, 60 to 80 percent of the cases are caused by either gallstones or chronic alcohol abuse. Now, I did mention with the pancreas earlier that it does have exocrine and digestive functions and endocrine and, and um, endocrine functions as well. Um, with somebody with pancreatitis, you may see more of abdominal issues and association of like cholecystitis or gallbladder issues when it's an acute flare-up, um, flank and epigastric pain. Um, usually doesn't have a lot of effect on the endocrine at this time. They mention it in the endocrine just because it is an endocrine organ. Um, but usually uh, when you have flare-ups of pancreatitis or issues of pancreatitis, it's usually going to be more of an abdominal emergency than it is an endocrine emergency. So adrenal insufficiency. We know that the adrenal glands are sitting right above the kidneys and they release several different important hormones or chemicals. All right, uh, is characterized by a decreased function of the adrenal cortex and consequent underproduction of cortisol and aldosterone. Um, we, I mentioned the aldosterone kind of affects the blood pressure, so if you have issues with that insufficient aldosterone, then you may have issues to maintain adequate blood pressure. Your cortisol's primary role is to assist with the response to stress. Um, cortisol is released to help you in stressful situations. It modulates glucose levels. It balances insulin. It regulates metabolism and carbohydrates. Is it that one? It's the one that just stopped. Yeah. That one. Alright. Um, usually though, folks with uh, adrenal insufficiency usually tolerates it and it's really not going to be something that you really see a whole lot and even if you do, eh, you know, the only way you're really going to know is if you memorize the textbook and they read the textbook. But you've got two different types of adrenal insufficiency. You've got primary and secondary. Primary is also known as Addison's disease. You may see Addison's disease on test and on registry. All right. You may see Graves' disease. You may see Hashimoto's disease. You may see Cushing's disease. All right. That's the kind of low frequency, <coughs> high criticality stuff that they like to test on. Okay. Um, Caused by atrophy or destruction of both adrenal glands leads to deficiency of all the steroid hormones. So your adrenal glands produce a lot of your uh, steroid hormones. So essentially primary adrenal insufficiency occurs when at least 90% of the adrenal cortex has been destroyed. A couple of different things uh, because of the, the issues with uh, Sodium uh, balance, you, they may start feeling a little salt craving, not salty. They may not. They may feel salty because they got Addison's disease. But um, increased pigmentation looks like they got a good tan, but when in fact they don't. Now this is the same person, the same picture, both extremities put together. One side is tanned, the other side's not. Increased pigmentation. Fatigue, anorexia. So with this, it, 
electrolyte imbalances, fluid imbalances, the sodium concentration in the blood falls, and by nature, potassium rises when sodium falls. What do you do? Impress your coworker if you're able to diagnose that patient with Addison's disease? I don't know. Initiate aggressive fluid replacement using 5% dextrose and normal saline. Uh, administer hydrocortisone. Secondary adrenal insufficiency is characterized by the lack of ACTH or adrenocorticotropic hormone. Stimulates the adrenal cortex to secrete cortisol. So if you've got the lack of that, then you're going to have a decrease in uh, cortisol production. Also, if somebody abruptly stops taking corticosteroids. Um, Somebody that's on steroids, steroid, long-term steroid treatment can screw somebody up and you can't just slowly or you can't just stop taking steroids. All right. Um, that's why usually if you're like on a steroid pack, let's say that you're on, a, on, on, on steroids for whatever you're on. I don't know, you, you, you had, I don't know, uh, what's you something to take steroids for? What? These things my dad has. Okay, on. yeah. And so usually you're going to have a loading dose for your steroids, like you take for three days, you take a double dose, and then you start taking a single dose. But usually you're, you're better, but you're still taking those meds. Why? Because you, you're trying to taper off. You, you just don't get better and just stop taking them. Because they can even affect a, a um, healthy person. All right? So with this, though, this may appear uh, suddenly. Um, which would then be called an Addisonian crisis. Remember, Addison's disease was primary adrenal insufficiency. Um, low blood pressure, confusion, weakness. The, really, the only way that, that I believe that, that you would really be able to put all this together is if you remembered this lecture today and you remembered reading this and you saw that they were taking steroids or either they had some kind of adrenal issue in the past, they were taking steroids, and then they quit taking steroids and now they're experiencing these signs and symptoms, all right? There's really no way for me to, like, really stress this to you guys as far as, like, you know, because this is not something you're going to see a whole lot, but it is still something that you need to know. You all right, brother? Yeah. I'm just trying to move. All right. Management. ABCs, fluids, glucose level. All right, Cushing syndrome. This is where we're talking about the moon face and the, the hump on the back. Um, excessive cortisol production or excessive amounts of corticosteroid hormone. Couple of characteristic things about these patients. Uh, issues with hyperglycemia. They got brittle bones, weak bones. They got a large abdomen. A lot of times, and then they've got this hump on their back, and then they've got a round face. This is all like unique to Cushing's. Also, because cortisol does help with stress, it also helps with mood. You may see issues with mood, depression, mood swings, weakness. Um, they, the the. Non-medical term is called a buffalo hump. My lovely buffalo hump. Increased acne, facial hair growth, scalp hair loss in women and cessation of menstrual periods. Darkening of skin on the neck. Obesity and poor growth and growth height in children. You know, again, supportive care. In these situations, really just knowing the patho and, and, and the name associated with the disease really is more because you're not going to do anything other than supportive care. Okay. Pheochromocytoma, which is a tumor in the adrenal gland. Um, rare condition in which the tumor usually in the medulla causes excessive release of hormones, epi and norepi. So what do you think the effects of this is going to be? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Catecholamine release. Jitteriness. All right. Growth hormone pathologies. 
Remember the anterior pituitary glands secretes growth hormones. We talked about this earlier. Um, remember I said that, that it would probably have some kind of disease process associated with the term megaly in it because you got excessive growth hormone, you're going to lead to excessive growth. Acromegaly, a condition usually diagnosed in young adulthood, results in gigantin, gigantism and abnormally large hands and face as well as facial characteristics. Under secretion is rare and is characterized by delayed development and growth. A lack of treatment may lead to dwarfism. I could be wrong, but there's actually a disease process where the person is has dwarfism for the first few years, maybe into their adolescent years, and then suddenly they start growing and they like go from dwarfism to gigant. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? You ever heard of that? Guarantee it's on TLC if it's something. All right. Um, I'm just trying to finish this up right here. Uh, hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism increases your metabolism. Hypothyroidism decreases metabolism. Think of somebody with an increased metabolism. Women always talking about that other girl. Oh, I wish I had her metabolism because I can eat whatever I want and still be skinny. Right? So somebody that's got high metabolism, they're going to be thinner. All right? But the issue, too, with hyperthyroidism is that they're going to have um, uh, catecholamine effects, sympathetic effects, uh, restlessness, um, rapid pulse, whereas hypothyroidism, they're going to be slow. Everything's going to be slowed down. They're going to be tired. They're going to have cold intolerance. They're going to um, even... They're, they're GI. They're, they're not going to be able to poop real good. Uh, just think, anything system-wise can be sped up for hyperthyroidism. Everything slowed down for hypothyroidism. Okay? Uh, this is that exothalamus right there. That looks a little extreme. We'll tell it to the guy that's got it. I'm sure that'll make him feel good about himself. Hey, man. You bring your eyes in just a little bit. I honestly, I think that this one right here is what's in uh, um, the Guinness Book of World Records, that guy that can pop his eyes out. But nonetheless, um, also goiter, goiter, that's an enlarged um, thyroid gland. Okay, So Graves' disease is a uh, hyperthyroidism, autoimmune disorder in which the thyroid gland hypertrophies, so it gets bigger and bigger and bigger as this activity increases. Now, sometimes what they actually have to do for an overactive thyroid gland is actually kill it. They have to load it down with lots of iodine and kill the gland, and then they have to start taking levothyroxine or some kind of synthetic thyroid. Um, other signs, uh, increased appetite, exothalamus, pretibial myxedema, or an orange peel appearance and non-pitting edema of the skin. Increased stress may lead to heart failure. So this is going to be increased release of T3 and T4. Um, and it inhibits the release of TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone. Okay. Hashimoto's disease. It's another cause of hyperthyroidism. It affects the TSH uh, receptors. Alright, so my exedema coma is going to be hypothyroidism. Mike's edema coma, and it could be a deadly situation. Um, severity is based on degree of deficiency. Includes fatigue, feeling cold, weight gain, dry skin, sleepiness, some subtle signs, but they could be unresponsive. They could be um, hypothermic. They, there's a lot of things that, that one of the big issues is hypothermia with somebody with this. Now, again, it usually takes a little bit more than what we are able to really do a full assessment to really get the full well-rounded understanding of what's going on with that patient. But again, understanding the baseline and these different endocrine disorders will help you. All right? Most cases occur during the winter in women older than 60 years old. Hypothyroidism, you know, it, it, it just slows everything down. All right? So what do we do for this? Monitor cardiac if they are hypothermic, warm them up. Now, one of the things that this could be one of those things that's just kind of slid in. You've got a patient that experiences a myxedema coma. What should you avoid? 
you don't give them anything that suppresses the nervous system, such as sedatives, narcotics, or anesthetics. I don't know why. If I was a better teacher, I would be able to tell you that. Um, thyroid toxicosis is going to be the other side of it. Myxedema is hypothyroidism emergency, thyroid toxicosis, also known as thyroid storm, excessive levels of circulated thyroid hormone. I have seen this almost kill a young man before. He came to the hospital very jittery, very just like, you know, heart rate was up, uh, blood pressure was up, like everything you would expect from a stimulated sympathetic nervous system, but they could not figure out what was going on until the doctor, good, very good doctor, was like, hey, I bet you this is what's going on. Let's take, let's test his, uh, his, his, T, uh, his uh, T3, T4. Let's test all of his uh, thyroid hormone levels and all that and come to find out that's exactly what was going on. It is. This one of all of them, uh, that myxedema coma and thyroid storm, that is certainly the low frequency, high criticality that you should know. Um, usually triggered by stressful events or increased volume of thyroid hormones in circulation. Um, high stress situations could cause this. What do you do? You, you, you transport them in a, in a low stimulating or low stimulus environment. You get them to the hospital as quick as you can because there's really nothing you can do. Thyroid uh, hormone, excessive amounts of thyroid hormone circulating in the body is just as bad as excessive amounts of epinephrine or norepinephrine and all that. Okay? Can you give them a sedative? Like if I rolled on now in the ambulance. I probably would get on the following medical control. They might, you might give them like an antiolytic or something like that, you know. Um, a pizza or something. That's um, what I was thinking. Like but I, 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 would, I would certainly talk to a medical control on that and see what, what's up with that. You know, it's going to be hard for you to describe what's going on with that patient. You know, and it's really going to be hard to figure that out. A lot of these situations here, if we're just going to be honest enough, and I, and, I, and I believe in being real with you guys, is that we, we learn about this stuff, but very rarely we'll see this stuff, and, and, and even more rarely are we going to say, hey, you know what, that is probably thyroid storm. I mean, the situations where I've seen thyroid storm, it took several, several medical professionals coming together, really doing lots of lab work and all that, kind of figuring out what was going on. You know, and I'm not saying that's always the case, but, you know, if, if, if they are acting, you know, anxious and increased blood pressure, heart rate and all that, you may could do a benzo or something like that to help chill them out. Um, hyperparathyroidism, just increased parathyroid hormone level, increases levels of blood calcium, hypercalcemia, decreased phosphate blood levels. Um, really not a lot here, manage ABCs. Panhypo, uh, panhypopituitarism, say that word three times fast, <laughs> inadequate production of or absence of really any of the, 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 the six or seven um, um, pituitary hormones that we um, had talked about, and each one of them is going to be different uh, presentations based off of which a hormone is not being produced. Or it could be all of them. All right? And then diabetes insipidus, or syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. The diabetes insipidus is not a pancreatic diabetes. Okay? This is more of a situation where the body is unable to regulate fluid caused by either a lack of ADH, antidiuretic hormone. So if you've got a lack of antidiuretic hormone, essentially what's going to happen? diuresis, right? You're going to continue to pee, continue to pee, continue to pee. Or, in um, the kidneys are unable to respond appropriately, um, ADH causes the kidneys to retain water, it causes increased urination. Um, one difference in, in diabetes insipidus and diabetes mellitus is the amount of glucose present in the urine. Obviously in DI, there's not going to be a lot, very diluted. Um, and then in diabetes mellitus, uh, mellitus, there is excessive amounts of glucose. How do you know? You taste it. If it's sweet, then you know there's lots of it in there. All right. Um, dehydration and electrolyte amounts is certainly something we worry about. Hyponatremia or low sodium. And then in SIADH uh, or syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, this you have an excessive amount of antidiuretic hormone, which results in a urinary output decrease which what happens? The fluid goes somewhere, it overloads the system. 
So DI is excessive urination. SIADH is going to be excessive fluid holding, I guess. Diabetes insipidus is because you don't have um, enough antidiuretic hormone to control the flow rate of, of urine. Where uh, syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion, you have too much and you don't pee enough. Okay? All right. Management for SIADH may include loop diuretics, but essentially we're going to symptomatically treat. I saw this, this question and I immediately thought of several of y'all yesterday <laughs> for this picture. All right. Any questions?